you want to give it one more minute or two and then we'll get started just so people can join up. Yes, I'm just, I am going to make sure that we are streaming live. Hello, everybody. All right, looks like everything's working. Awesome. Thank you for joining everyone who has joined already. Mm -hmm. We are going to give it a couple minutes so yeah. folks can log on and then those who are on Facebook can join the Facebook live stream. If you're in attendance, please type in the chat and let us know you're here. And while we're waiting for everyone, I'd love to hear if you have a special waterway that you care about or a wetland, a bog that you really love. We'd love to hear what those are. I like Gretchen Dillon's response. We care about it all. <laughs> agree. Definitely agree. All right, Renee, it seems like we have quite a few people on, so why don't we, why don't we get started? Okay, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So, um, hi everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar um, on the rollback of the Clean Water Act and protecting New York's waterways. Um, my name is Renee Secor. I'm the legislative advocacy intern at Riverkeeper, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, we have three really great panelists that I want to just introduce quickly. Um, my colleague, Jeremy Cherson, is the Legislative Advocacy Manager for Riverkeeper. We have Roger Downs, the Conservation Director at for Sierra Club Atlantic Chapter. And then John Devine, from, uh, the Director of Federal Policy at NRDC. We also have uh, many of our partnering organizations that co-sponsored today's panel. So we would like to also thank all of them for um, supporting today's panel. Um, it's a great and informative panel. I just wanted to cover some housekeeping items really quickly before we get started. So first, our presenters will not be monitoring the chat during the presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A tool if you're a registered Zoom participant. You can find that at the bottom of the screen and click, it, click Q&A. It'll pop up and you can type in a question. We'll be holding all questions till the end of the presentation, but you can ask them at any time. Um, for those of you tuning in through Facebook Live, I'll be monitoring the comment section, so feel free to leave any questions there, and then we will try to get to as many as we can um, at the end. And with that, I'll let uh, Jeremy and Roger kick us off. Thank you so much. So let's start with why we love and value streams and wetlands. 
I asked you all in the beginning, those who tuned in a few minutes ago, to tell us about some of the places you really love and cherish. And many of you did. Uh, and you can see here, I put up a few of my favorite photos from my journey around New York. And, you know, we love streams and wetlands because they provide a lot of benefits for communities and for, for people, for wildlife. Those are things like flood and stormwater control. You know, with climate change, precipitation events in New York and the Northeast are increasing. And so that means we need to protect streams and wetlands in order to prevent floods in communities. They also protect surface water and groundwater. That is essential for drinking water supplies for communities around the state. If you protect the integrity of a stream or the biological uh, integrity of a wetland, then you, in essence, protect the drinking water for millions of New Yorkers. They also provide erosion control. You know, erosion is a very serious issue across the state. It can lead to mudslides. It can lead to deteriorated water quality when you don't have shorelines of streams that are stabilized, when you have wetlands that are filled in or destroyed. Uh, all that sediment goes downstream and degrades water quality. You have pollution treatment and nutrient cy cycling. Wetlands are amazing filters of pollution. They'll take all kinds of pollution from farm runoff to industrial contaminants and process them so that on the outflow of a wetland, you end up with much cleaner water than when it came in. And of course, for many of us, we care about fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, you can see here uh, a red F on the left uh, as one of my favorite salamanders in the state. In the middle, we have river herring that in the Hudson River come back each spring from the ocean to their ancestral headwaters. And those headwaters are the very types of streams that are under threat from the Trump administration. And those fish, the river herring, depend on those. And to the right, we have a meadow in the Catskills and a beautiful butterfly that depends on that meadow and wetland being intact. We also care a lot about recreational opp opportunities, particularly now with many people being stuck inside due to COVID-19, the ability to give, get outside has never seemed more important. And so protecting these waterways and wetlands are incredibly valuable, not only for recreational opportunities today, but for developing recreational opportunities in the future. So now that we've gone over a few of the values that we kind of care about, let's dive into the science. In 2015, the EPA looked at over 1,200 peer-reviewed studies and concluded that small streams and wetlands have a major impact on downstream water quality. And you can see here all the reasons and all the findings that the researchers at the EPA found. Streams, no matter their size, are incredibly important to protecting water downstream. Wetlands and floodplains are just the same. No matter how far up a wetland is from a major water body, that water flows downstream. And if you can protect the purity of a wetland and the water upstream, you will protect the water downstream. And so I'm gonna turn it over to our special guest, John Devine from NRDC who works on federal water policy to talk a little bit about what the Trump administration is up to. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, John. Terrific, thanks a lot, Jeremy. Um, and thanks so much, everybody, for having me here today. Uh, it's a real privilege. Uh, um, uh, I wish it were under better circumstances because I wanna talk about this new federal rule from the Trump administration, which dramatically restricts what kinds of water bodies the Federal Clean Water Act protects. Uh, this 
rule, which we call the dirty water rule, is reckless, and many parties have already filed litigation over it. So I'll describe a little bit of what the rule does and then focus on some of the most significant problems I see with it. Um, specifying what's meant by the phrase waters of the United States in, in the Clean Water Act uh, may sound like a very wonky issue, but it really couldn't be more crucial. That term is the trigger for numerous of the Act's protections, including programs that prevent oil spills, limit toxic discharges, require the cleanup of waters that are too polluted for fishing or swimming, and prevent unlimited development that buries streams and marshes. Uh, basically, if a feature is not a water of the United States, most of the pollution prevention control and cleanup requirements in the law don't apply. The dirty water rule creates new loopholes that make the law weaker than it has in several decades by excluding numerous waters from the Clean Water Act's protection. Specifically, it eliminates uh, decades-old protections for interstate waters, it excludes rain-dependent streams from protection and likely other streams it excludes so-called isolated waters from the law without regard to their impacts on other waterways. It excludes adjacent wetlands ex and ponds, except for ones with a limited set of connections to other covered waters. And it expands a pre-existing exclusion for what's known as prior converted cropland, uh, so that wetlands on land that has ceased to be used for agriculture uh, now can qualify for the exclusion. Um, it's easier for excluded waters to be polluted or destroyed. Uh, that's important because as, as Jeremy said at the outset, these waters serve many, give us many benefits. They filter pollution, they serve as nurseries for fish, act as drinking water supplies, natural flood barriers, and more. And it's also important because these waters are everywhere. Uh, there are more than two million miles of rain dependent streams in the country, which is likely a big underestimate. And an EPA preliminary analysis of the proposed rule indicated that it could exclude approximately 51% of the roughly 110 million acres of wetlands in the continental 48. So let me talk, talk a little bit about the worst problems with the rule. Uh, which collectively make this the most reckless attack I've ever seen in, on clean water. First, stripping clean water protections now is just dumb. It, the country hasn't come close to, to meeting the Act's goals of eliminating pollutant discharges or making waters nationwide swimmable, swimmable or fishable. Nationwide still more than half of the assessed waters don't meet state water quality standards for one or more pollutants. In New York, of the water bodies the state has assessed, 12% of rivers and streams, 50% of lakes and ponds, and 58% of bays and estuaries aren't meeting all of the relevant standards. But those statistics just tell a little bit of the story. You know, rarely a day goes by where you don't see a major news story about a water pollution prob problem somewhere in the country. And so we really should be strengthening water protections, not weakening them. The rule also completely ignores robust scientific evidence demonstrating that the kinds of streams and wetlands it will leave unprotected are crucial to the health of downstream water bodies. So for instance, the, the rule excludes rain-dependent or ephemeral streams like the ones shown on this slide. Um, and that's what they look like when they're dry. But uh, Jeremy, if you could go forward, um, you can see that the next slide shows what, what some of these uh, waters look like with flow. And as scientists have overwhelmingly concluded, and, and you heard earlier, these kinds of streams directly and significantly impact downstream waters. Uh, next slide, please. The rules treatment of wetlands, like the ones shown in these next couple slides, similarly disregards the science. 
Next, please. Um, what the scientific record shows is that wetlands in the floodplains of streams, as well as many non-floodplain wetlands, are critical to water quality, flow, and aquatic life in downstream waters. We can go on. Um, however, the dirty water rule doesn't follow the science in determining which wetlands to regulate. It instead only covers wetlands under limited conditions which are not linked to the scientific evidence. Next, please. Many scientists uh, objected to the rules on scientific approach. Uh, notably, uh, EPA's own science advisors on the Independent Science Advisory Board, uh, many of whom were handpicked by uh, the uh, current uh, administrator, uh, found that the, S the SAB found that the proposed rule uh, lacks a scientific justification while potentially introducing new risks to human and environmental health. In contrast, as you heard earlier, when the prior administration issued the regulations that this rule replaced, they based their rule on more than 1,200 peer-reviewed publications. Next slide, please. Another major problem with the rule is that it's hopeless, it's full of hopelessly vague terminology that will make the rule impossible to effectively implement in the real world. You wouldn't know that uh, to hear EPA Administrator Wheeler describe the rule as he does here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, the, the rule uh, does not live up to the rhetoric. The, for example, the rule links protections to a water body's flow conditions in a, quote, typical year, but then provides what can only be described as a gibberish definition of that term. The agencies say that the typical year need not be based on an actual calendar year, uh, and they fail to provide any kind of predictable data set or methodology for determining if conditions are typical. Instead, the rule says that people are supposed to try to evaluate, and I'm not making this up, quote, the characteristics of a water body at times that are not too wet and not too dry which is obviously unhelpful. Uh, additionally, the agencies say that the assessment should be based on data from the prior 30-year period, but fail to consider that climate change is going to dramatically alter conditions such that water bodies' prior wetness or dryness often will be an unreliable predictor of uh, their future state. Also, because um, one of the key differences or, or triggers in the rule is whether a stream flows intermittently or ephemerally, the rule makes the assessment. Uh, John, I think you accidentally went on mute. I sure did. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I'll go back a sec. Uh, Protections under the rule um, are, are also vague in one in a critical respect because uh, they turn on whether or not a stream is, is considered uh, to flow intermittently or ephemerally. Um, but the assessment of that condition uh, will turn on a highly subjective balancing of all kinds of specialized data that are unlikely to be of easily accessible to the typical stakeholder. Um, tellingly, the, the rule itself <clears throat> says that clarity in, as an end in itself is not the primary or fundamental basis for the final rule, kind of begging the question of what is the basis for the rule. Um, the last major problem with the rule is that it's illegal. It relies on a theory that no court has accepted and that five Supreme Court justices rejected. Moreover, the agencies failed to do the legally required work of justifying this radical change in policy in light of what it would do to public health and safety, to the environment, and to the economy that depends on water resources. When President Trump directed the agencies to develop uh, a new rule very early in his term, 
His executive order directed the agencies to consider basing the rule on an opinion in the most recent Supreme Court case about this issue from Justice Scalia. That, ju that opinion was joined by only three other justices and was roundly criticized by the other five. Um, uh, next slide, please. Since that case, courts have consistently rejected efforts to restrict protections to waterways based on the limitations Justice Scalia invented. Nevertheless, the dirty water rule relies on this discredited approach. Next slide, please. The rule is also unlawful because it arbitrarily ignores a critical aspect of the problem. The administration says that they do not know what the condition of the waters will be affected by the rule. But that ought to be the first and most important question to try to answer when considering a policy change under the Clean Water Act. The agencies claim to be incapable of estimating the extent of streams, wetlands, or other waters that will be affected by their rule. And because they say they can't estimate that, the agencies also say they can't predict how many industrial facilities might escape pollution limits, or the number of refineries or other oil plants that could avoid developing spill prevention and response plans. And they claim they have no meaningful idea how much increased pollution from the rule will harm people drinking more contaminated supplies, fishing or swimming in polluted waters, or living in flood-prone areas where wetlands have been paved over. And because of that failure, the administration also says it can't meaningfully examine the full economic costs the rule would impose on society. The Trump administration wants us all to simply accept that they're gutting decades old protections without any evidence that those waters won't be seriously damaged and with loads of reasons to expect otherwise. And what's worse, their claimed inability to assess the expected harms is bogus. There are national databases that show the extent of various water resources, reams of historic information that could help the agencies predict how water bodies would be impacted by these regulatory changes, and scientific studies and models that could be used to assess the effects of polluting or destroying water bodies. It is certainly true that the, the administration does not have perfect information, but they don't need it. And they have the capacity to use existing tools to at least provide reasonable estimates of the range of impacts that this rule would inflict. I suspect they refuse to do so because they're afraid to share those estimates with the public and reveal how disastrous this rule truly would be. Um, but even if you take the administration at its word that this analysis is impossible, it lacks any reasonable basis for saying that the rule is good policy. If they were acting reasonably, the agency should have taken the time they needed to actually analyze the impacts of it as well as other potential regulatory options. Instead, they did the most reckless thing possible. They rushed to put out a rule while claiming, the, claiming ignorance of, the, of its consequences for people's health, public si safety, and the environment. Next slide. For these and other reasons, numerous stakeholders concerned about the impacts the rule would have on important waters have sued the Trump administration to invalidate the rule. That includes us at NRDC as well as a number of other environmental groups and a group of 17 states plus Washington DC and New York City, which sued together in California. New York State is one of the leaders of that litigation and those states have asked the court to prevent the rule from taking effect on June 22nd as it's currently scheduled to do. And that's it for me. Thank you very much again for letting me uh, join you today. Thank you so much, John. I'm now gonna turn it over to my friend, Roger Downs, the chapter director for the Sierra Club Atlantic chapter to give a overview of what's at stake for New York's wetlands. Thanks, Jeremy, and I, I want to thank John for that fine overview of where we're at at the federal level. Uh, I'm going to try to dive in at the state level to discuss how the Freshwater Wetlands Program works now in New York, how our enforcement of the Clean Water Act potentially interfaces with the Trump rollbacks, and what New York State can do to effectively fill in the gaps. Uh, 
The New York Wetlands Protection Act uh, was passed by the legislature and signed into law in 1975 with the knowledge that we had already lost half the state's wetlands over the previous 100 years. Article 24 establishes jurisdiction for the DEC to regulate land use and freshwater wetlands that are on the state wetlands maps. Uh, DEC is directed to place on the map wetlands that are 12.4 acres or larger or smaller wetlands that are of unusual local importance. We call those ULEs. Placing wetlands on jurisdictional maps involves a rather cumbersome and expensive process of field identification, public notice, and a hearing process that can take many years to complete. Uh, but if a fen, bog, marsh, swamp, or wet clay meadow is not on an official state map, it does not receive DEC protection. Um, New York's wetland protection program overlaps with the federal program in that New York relies on the Army Corps to protect wetlands smaller than 12.4 acres, which is a significant portion of our wetlands. Uh, in this discussion today, we're, we're excluding the Adirondack Park Agency that regulates down to one acre within the blue line and a small number of municipalities across the state that have more restrictive local wetland laws. Um, I wanna draw your attention to this map created by the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for a section of Erie County that illustrates the limitations of New York's jurisdictional maps. Uh, you can see the slightly hatched areas in purple. Uh, those are regulated wetlands on approved state maps, but the dark and light green areas that fall outside of the hatching are wetlands that the Fish and Wildlife Service identified in addition to what is recognized by the state. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, why is there so much discrepancy? Part of it is that wetlands are not static and they can move over time and maps should be updated regularly. And I think, um, you know, John said something really crucial. And I think that this is certainly, you know, new for New York in terms of our interface with the Army Corps of Engineers. The notion that, um, you know, agricultural land uh, that, uh, you know, is pr was previously agricultural and has been overtaken by wetlands. And I think we are seeing over time, the state is gaining some wetlands in some areas where there once was agriculture everywhere and ditches were filled in and now, or, or ditches were, were, were dug and now are slowly filling in and becoming agriculture again. Um, if you want to go back and farm it again, there aren't state restrictions on doing that. But if you want to put a house there, uh, you're going to have to apply for a wetland permit uh, and go through the process. What is unclear is wetlands under 12.4 acres uh, that will be regulated by the Corps, are they going to ignore that now? And we've only been looking at isolated wetlands, but I think there's a whole sear of wetlands now that we have to consider that the Corps may be uh, ignoring. And um, I mean, part of the other reason that the the that we're finding more and more wetlands is just DEC biologists are human and simply miss wetlands in their surveys as well. And it's fair to say, with only a few exceptions, most of these state wetland jurisdictional maps have not been updated in over 20 years, making them significantly incomplete. I think the good news is that the wetlands that made the original maps in the 70s and 80s or were part of a map amendment process since receive excellent protection. Um, where permits are scrutinized by the state with strong avoidance and mitigation standards for every project. There's also a 100-foot buffer around every map wetland, which allows DEC to regulate activities that may immediately affect wetlands outside of their boundaries. This is not the case for federally protected wetlands. But the bad news is the limited number of wetlands on approved maps comes nowhere near covering New York's 12.4 million acres of wetlands. There are possibly hundreds of thousands of acres of wetlands in New York that fall within the larger than 12.4 acre category, but are not on, on maps. And as John explained, up until the early 2000s, the federal program nearly universally regulated wetlands that fell before the 12.4, below the 12.4 acre threshold. And New York relied on the Army Corps uh, to protect these critical habitat areas. But in the aftermath of the 2001 Swank decision, and now with the Trump rollbacks, the Clean Water Rule, 
so-called isolated wetlands, and now we have to consider former agricultural lands that fall below the 12.4 acre threshold are no longer protected. Some estimates put that number at around 40% of New York's wetlands, and it could be higher. Um, next slide. So New York is the only state not to establish some form of regulatory control over all its wetlands in the wake of the federal abdication of jurisdiction. And it is long past due that we catch up with our neighboring states. Um, here on the, the map of the New York Lakeshore of Lake Ontario, uh, we can see there's an area that has had historically dealt with major flooding issues. Uh, you can see the green indicates wetlands that are on the state maps, and the red indicates wetlands that would have been deemed isolated and smaller than 12.4 acres, receiving no regulatory protection under the new rules. Um, but if you can also see that this vast complex of smaller isolated wetlands in red doesn't in a larger sense appear to be that isolated, patterning around more significant water courses that contribute greatly to the water quality of the larger system, it would appear that they are also deserving of protection, despite not having an obvious nexus to what are considered now waters of the United States. And when we talk about protection, I want to make it clear that the Clean Water Act and Article 24 don't necessarily prohibit the disturbance of wetlands. These laws and regulations provide the structure to make the best developmental uh, decisions uh, for, for contractors and minimize impact that we are having on these critical natural areas if we cannot avoid disturbing them. Uh, but land developers often claim that wetlands permits deprive them of prime building lots and the profits that go with utilizing private land to its fullest. But we've seen countless examples of where construction in wetlands leads to what can only be described as consumer fraud. Future homeowners of these ill-conceived developments are often left with shifting foundations, flooded basements, and harmful mold infestations. And filling in wetlands can shift hydrology and cause new flooding problems for existing neighborhoods elsewhere that were once dry. We will continue to struggle with more community flooding disasters if we don't correct our flood state permitting program and reverse regulatory rollbacks at the federal level. So the big question is, what does New York do about it? For the past 15 years, the advocacy community has attempted to pass legislation in the form of the Clean Water Protection Flood Prevention Act, which is the gold standard reform package. This gives the state of New York jurisdiction over wetlands one acre or larger, down from the 12.4 acres, eliminates DEC's freshwater wetlands maps as the basis for regulation. And they're now only for ed educational purposes and instead sets guidelines for what is a wetland, uh, which is simply the presence of hydrophilic plants. These are wetland plants adapted to survive in water and hydric soils, soils that are permanently or seasonally saturated by water. Um, you know, this is the Army Corps standard. This is how they identify wetlands. And I think at this point, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck and the state should be able to protect wetlands as they are threatened or identified. Uh, the bill also removes an outdated wetland classification system that really doesn't get to the core of what makes wetlands valuable. Um, you know, clearly the bill has been difficult to pass over the past few decades because of the perennial gridlock in the legislature. But with the advent of the leadership of Andrea Stewart Cousins and the new Progressive Senate, Many of us felt this was the year we could finally close the gaps in wetland protection. That was, <laughs> certainly was until the COVID-19 outbreak, but I, I think there's still reason for optimism. Um, in his budget proposal earlier this year, Governor Cuomo provided Article 7 language, uh, and we can move to the next slide, that would do away with the jurisdictional barriers created by the outdated maps and allow DEC to immediately protect and regulate all wetlands mapped and unmapped over 12.4 acres if they meet the basic scientific definitions of these critical habitat areas. Uh, again, featuring hydrophilic plants and hydric soils. Commissioner Sagos also hinted that under the proposal, the state may use its selective powers to identify and protect unusual and, and important wetlands smaller than 12.4 acres more aggressively 
with the claim that the whole regulatory overhaul would be akin to adding an additional 1 million acres of wetlands under the state's protection. Um, and while the negotiations ended with the entrance of the pandemic crisis, there were encouraging new ideas discussed between the governor's staff, the Senate and the Assembly on the bill that indicated that there's some hope on the horizon. Well, the governor appeared unwilling to lower the jurisdictional threshold from 12.4 acres to a smaller amount for reasons of staffing, uh, shortfalls in, a, in difficult economic times. There was new focus in negotiations on protecting wetlands based upon function and value, not arbitrary acreage size, which I think is positive. Not to be forgotten, under the governor's leadership, the legislature passed a $3 billion Restore Mother Nature Bond Act that if passed by the voters on the ballot in the fall will dedicate unprecedented funding to wetlands restoration, flood control, critical habitat acquisition, and source water protection. The governor estimates that over the next decade, the state will incur $50 billion in flood water damage alone, and restoring wetlands will help attenuate the worst of these deluges. But in the context of our talk today, certainly it is more cost effective to invest in the upfront protection of wetlands rather than restoring ones that have been, we've allowed uh, to be destroyed. Um, lastly, I, I wanna get back to the practical matter of the wetlands maps. It is clear that legislative reform will not come until next year, and we are still left with the conundrum that the state cannot regulate a wetland unless it is on an approved map, but the maps remain woefully incomplete and difficult to amend. Um, as an example, a 2009 survey of the Genesee Valley, the Wallkill watershed, and the Oswego on Onondaga watersheds produce over 50,000 acres of new wetlands, not currently on official DEC maps. Uh, but political pressure from land developers and high administrative costs have prevented DEC from releasing these maps to the public, essentially blocking them from state protection. Uh, here's an example of one of the dozens of quad maps DEC produced during the survey. Uh, and you can see that in the next slide, I think. And we can see significant new additions in dark green and shifting boundaries noted by the red areas that indicate patches that, are no, long, that no longer can be identified as wetlands. Um, as you can see, there's significantly more wetland area now than was previously mapped. Uh, this information is critical to land planners who are charged with implementing climate resiliency plans, guiding smart land development, protecting drinking water, and preventing excessive floods. Uh, we are asking the DEC to finally come through, amend these 50,000 acres onto the state's official wetland maps and start engaging the public in how they can enhance, not to destroy uh, this irreplaceable resource. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is a dangerous time for all of us, and we should maintain laser focus on keeping our loved ones safe and the curve of infection as flat as possible. But it's also a tenuous time for wetlands, as there will be more pressure to fill and build in wet areas with the uncertainty at the federal level and a perception that DEC enforcers are hobbled at the state level while no one is looking. We need everyone to be our eyes and ears and report wetlands and stream violation to DEC. Again, in order to preserve the valuable environmental and public safety functions performed by wetlands, and in light of the anticipated rollbacks in regulation by the federal government, New York must expand the jurisdiction of its wetland protection law to cover smaller wetlands without being encumbered by outdated mapping requirements. Um, thank you, Jeremy, for providing uh, you know, this, this, this platform today to talk about these issues. And I'll turn to you now to talk about the protection of New York streams. Thank you so much, Roger. So I'm gonna take us now into a closer look at New York streams and what's at risk and what we can do about it. So New York streams are under threat as Roger mentioned, it's very similar, the protection that streams had, as did wetlands, from the Army Corps, the Federal Army Corps of Engineers. There was a time 
that the Army Corps would require someone who wanted to cross a stream, fill a stream, change a stream bank, had to apply for a Section 404 permit and get some level of basic scrutiny of the activity that it was being proposed to change or disturb a water body. As John mentioned, that is that time, that oversight is likely over. And you can see here on a map produced by our friends at Earth Justice, just what the Trump rule does and all the things that we've talked about today. You know, it's okay to, produce, to pollute intermittent tributaries. It's okay to pollute ephemeral streams. It's okay to pollute excluded wetlands, so on and so forth. So let's take a closer look at New York. Our partners at Trout Unlimited did an ana a state by state analysis, and you can go to their website and see if they have data on your state if you're not from New York. Here we have the entire state. We have a little over 100,000 miles of streams according to the US Geological Survey. And 29 of those streams, 29% of those streams that are mapped are intermittent, which means they only flow for part of the year. They are not continuously flowing streams. And then one mile of every unmapped ephemeral stream, so precipitation fed streams, so streams that only flow during rain or snow events, exist for every one mile of mapped stream in New York. And so you can see some of the rivers, creeks, and watersheds in New York that have high amounts of these intermittent streams. You can see the Genesee River watershed is amongst the highest of the watersheds in New York that with intermittent streams. You can also see the Delaware River watershed also has a high number of these streams and is a, a particularly important uh, source of drinking water for, for downstream uh, uh, folks in Pennsylvania and also for the biological integrity of the Chesapeake Bay. And the Hudson River Valley and the Mohawk Valley also contain somewhat lower amounts of intermittent streams, but we still contain a good portion of intermittent and ephemeral streams. Ephemeral are the ones that are only fed by precipitation. And we are no longer sure if those streams will receive federal protection. Now, New York State does have a state level protection program for its streams. This sets us apart from states like Arizona, which do not have state level programs and could lose up to 90% of their protections on water bodies. New York is not as in bad of shape as our, some of our Western counterparts, but our program here in the state still falls short of filling the gaps that are going to be left by the federal government. So, our current program, the Protection of Waters program, is a permit that protects streams from course modification, bank disturbance, and infilling. But it also extends required permitting considerations for impacts to headwater streams. And so streams across New York are broken down by classes. You have double A and A, which is the highest level of protection that the state affords uh, a stream under this program, and those are usually sources of drinking water. And permits are required. Uh, somebody who wants to uh, develop near a stream or cross a stream will have to get a basic level of scrutiny from DEC and possibly have to make some changes to their plans in order to protect water quality and the biological integrity of a stream. You have class B, which is uh, primarily for swimming and other contact recreation, such as kayaking, but not usually for drinking water. And a permit is also required there. You also have Class C streams, which are the majority of unprotected streams in this program in the state. And that is largely used for fisheries, uh, for fishing, but not suitable 
for non-contact, uh, uh, not suitable for contact such as swimming. And they only require a permit if there are known trout in the stream or if it is known that trout spawn in that stream. And then we have a smaller amount of streams getting the classification of D. These are usually impaired waterways. Um, but you know, just like the wetlands maps, many of these classifications uh, of the streams are decades old and outdated. So many of these streams that received these classifications in the past, thanks to the leadership of the state and to local partners who have focused on improving water quality, many of the C and D streams could likely move up into higher classifications if they were reassessed. But due to budget and staffing shortfalls at our Department of Environmental Conservation, many of these reassessments have not happened. So where are these Class C streams? We have 41,000 miles of them across the state. And you can see them broken down by the watershed uh, that they exist in here. And these Class C streams are often these smaller headwater streams that connect to larger bodies of water that provide the drinking water sources to communities around the state or some of the state's best fisheries supporting tourism activities uh, as well and other recreational opportunities. 11.2 million New Yorkers rely on small streams for drinking water, including the city of Peekskill in Westchester County. 58,000 people in Peekskill, Buchanan, and Cortland rely on a brook called Peekskill Hollow Brook. And you can see it here on the map. If you look at the, to the right, the map on the right, you can see in light pink, we have all the smaller Class C feeder streams that flow into the dark purple Peekskill Hollow Brook. Those light pink feeder streams are not under the protection of the DEC's Protection of Waters program, even though they provide the source water for 58,000 people. So one would assume you would want to protect those streams from unfettered development and disturbance. But because streams have not been reassessed or reassessment takes a long time, many of them still are in this class C category when they should be A or double A. And here's a little example of what Peekskill Hollow Brook looks like. Another example is the Salk Hill in Annandale on Hudson in Dutchess County in the Hudson Valley of New York. This is the drinking water supply for Bard College. It is a class B trout stream and local advocates have been working to petition it for reclassification to a class A stream because it provides drinking water for a community. Several of the Saul Kills tributaries are Class C, which could allow for their diversion, fill, or altercation without a permit. And that could degrade the water quality for approximately 5,000 students, faculty, and staff at the college. And outside the Hudson Valley, where I focus, here in the Buffalo Niagara watershed, thanks to our partners at the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. You can see here a Class C stream going through a golf course in Western New York that has undergone significant modification. You can also see that under normal conditions, you would wanna have trees and shrubs and a buffer between the grass and dirt to protect water quality. You can see on the left erosion occurring because there is no buffer. And this did not require a permit because it is a class C stream. On the right, you can see in light pink, all the class C stream segments that are excluded 
from the Protection of Waters program. It is a large number of streams. And as I mentioned, classifications are often outdated and misclassi misclassifications are common. The city of Newburgh, which is in the Hudson Valley, has many misclassifications and many streams to their drinking water supply that are unmapped. You can see here a couple of my colleagues, Jen and Sebastian at Brown's Pond, which is one of the drinking water reservoirs for the city of Newburgh that exists outside the city boundaries. And so the city has no authority to regulate activities in its drinking water supply because a different town has that, author has that planning and regulatory authority. And many of the segments, three have been identified, uh, sources to this Brown's Pond, are currently Class C when they should be classified as Class A since they are the drinking water supply or sources for the city of Newburgh. So Newark streams need greater state protection because of this misclassification, because of the outdated nature uh, of the classifications and because of the federal rollback. It makes a lot of uncertainty to what is going to receive protection and what is going to fall into a gap. There is a piece of state legislation, the Stream Protection Act, that would protect these 41,000 miles of Class C streams across New York and require a base level of scrutiny of activities that may disturb them. This past year before the COVID-19 crisis, it passed the assembly by an overwhelming vote. It passed the Senate in the previous year also by an overwhelming bipartisan vote. But due to rules, the Senate has to pass it again in this legislative session or take it up again in a future session after November's election. In the Senate, it has currently made it through all committees that it is required to make it through and is currently sitting on the Senate floor ripe for a vote. It could be called forth to a vote any day and passed and sent to the governor's desk. And we urge that to happen. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Renee to talk about some of the actions we can collectively take to ensure that waterways and wetlands are protected in absence of state and federal protections. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, so I'm sure you all are wondering um, with all of that information, what we can actually do to push back against um, the federal rollback and what actions can be taken. Um, and so I've broken it up into uh, three different uh, levels, federal action, state action, and then what we can also do on the local level. So I'm gonna go over each of these uh, briefly. So at the federal level, um, we would obviously like to see this EPA rule not go into effect. Um, and so we're asking individuals to contact your member of Congress to ask them to stop the impl implementation of this rule. And they can do so by passing and sponsoring the Clean Water Act, the Clean Water for All Act, which was a, uh, is a new bill that was introduced last month and sponsored by Representative DeFazio. And this would stop the EPA from implementing their dirty water rule, what we call the dirty water rule. Um, Riverkeeper actually has an action alert set up for you to directly contact a representative um, and ask them to sponsor this piece of legislation. And currently we don't, um, none of the New York congressional representatives have sponsored it. And so this is a really great way to ask them to sponsor this and support this piece of legislation. Um, then at the state level, um, there's um, important acts that can be taken. Um, and this is important um, to see action at the state level, level because as um, uh, Roger and Jeremy mentioned, we're kind of looking for New York to fill the gap that we see now with the rollback of um, the Federal Clean Water Act. We're looking for New York to step up protections. And so people should contact their state representatives and urge them to protect New York's wetlands and streams in the face of these federal rollbacks. There's two bills um, that Jeremy and Roger both mentioned aimed at protecting streams and wetlands here in New York. And so 
we, Riverkeeper also has an action alert um, to contact your state representative and ask them to protect New York streams and wetlands. I will also link that action alert as well. Um, in addition, we ask that you can contact uh, Governor Cuomo and um, Commissioner, DEC Commissioner Basil uh, Sagos and urge them to prioritize protecting uh, small streams and isolated wetlands with their existing authority. And then lastly, I want to mention, Roger uh, mentioned as well, that there is the $3 billion Restore Mother, Nature, Restore Mother Nature Bond Act that will be on the back of your ballots in November here in New York. And this is a direct way to support uh, New York waterways. Um, and, and money is actually directly allocated to things like wetland restoration. And so it's important um, that this act passes um, in order to protect and uh, help protect New York waterways. Lastly, at the local level, um, um, Roger kind of mentioned having um, eyes and ears on the ground and how crucially important that is. And so we're hearing that we're hearing that there may be an increase of filling in of wetlands in some areas here in the state of New York. And so it's important that we have our local communities and supporters looking out for these actions um, and reporting them um, to DEC um, if you see any suspicious activity, filling of wetlands and whatnot. So we have listed DEC's contact number um, to report these activities as well as Riverkeeper's um, contact number as well. Um, and I will link the online forms um, that DEC has where you could report any suspicious activity as well. Um, and with that, um, I want to thank you all for joining this panel, um, for all the participants, and also thank all of our panelists for their great presentations. Um, and I think we have, yeah, we have a few minutes, so if we want to open it up to questions. Um, I think right now we only have one question, um, so we can start with this one. So, this is from Stephen DeWitt. Um, how does this new rule impact current and ongoing riparian restoration? I don't know which panelist um, would like to answer that one. Yeah, maybe John. I think I just wanted a little bit of an answer, I think. Um, ordinarily, as I understand it, uh, riparian stream bank work would require compliance with some Army Corps conditions aimed at protecting degradation of the stream. And if the stream itself were newly deregulated by this federal rule, if it was ephemeral or it's one of these uh, intermittent streams, that's hard to tell if they're, uh, if it's ephemeral um, or not, um, then, um, then those conditions may not apply. Oh, I think we just got a few more. Um, so this one is from Bill Fetter. Um, are there Army Corps of Engineer published wetlands that could could adapted by the state if so chosen? I mean, we we've debated this for years that um, the Army Corps actually has a process, there's a form, there's an application process the developer goes through to have the core determine, is this an isolated wetland? Does this fall within our jurisdiction or not? And there's a formal process and in the end, the core may tell a developer, we believe this wetland that you wanna fill in is isolated, so we waive our jurisdiction. Um, you know, we certainly have thought that there are ways that the state of New York can come in at that point and using its powers to declare local and unusual wetlands, you know, go through a quick map amendment process or ask, you know, to, to apply a general permit uh, in, that, in that situation. But it, you know, it requires state initiative. It's not ideal. And I think that that's why getting, getting legislation to clarify uh, that, that New York state has jurisdictional authority over much smaller wetlands, if not all wetlands, um, you know, I, I think, you know, is, is clearly the, the right answer. Uh, but in this context, I think the state does have powers to move in, but they have to be 
coordinating with the Army Corps and there has to be an MOU of some sort so that they are getting, you know, and, and at least aware of these wetlands as they're being rejected. I don't know if John or anyone else has further on that. Okay. Um, and then we have another question from Gail. Um, is there any impact of discharges from Indian Point nuclear power plant on the streams around Buchanan and Cortland? Is there any protection because of this situation involving a nuclear power plant? I can take that one. Um, well, luckily for us, the Hudson River is considered under any interpretation as a water of the United States. Uh, and because the discharges from Indian Point are directly into the Hudson River and not into tributaries farther back into uh, the headwaters of, say, um, Peekskill Brook, uh, Hollow Brook, or um, uh, uh, other local streams, that they're, they are required to get Clean Water Act uh, permits for discharges and uh, part of the reason why the plant uh, shut down one reactor and is going to shut down uh, the next reactor next year is because Riverkeeper and our partners have challenged those permits over many years. Um, I think that's all the questions I see for now. Let me are there, do you know if there are, are there any questions from Facebook? Yeah, I don't see any in the comments right now, but if anybody is interested, they can type one into the comments. Here's another question. Okay. Oh yeah, so from Laura, do municipalities who have class C or D, class C or D streams in their jurisdiction or smaller wetlands have the jurisdiction to add additional protections to those areas? Absolutely. You know, we, we have plenty of great examples. I mean, you know, a lot of them are from Westchester County and in, in, in high development areas, but there are some municipalities that have really good uh, wetlands and, and stream laws to keep development uh, out of these sensitive critical habitat areas because they find if they don't, they end up with a lot of their community underwater uh, that they really have to, to manage these wetlands as resources. Uh, and there are plenty of good model uh, wetlands um, municipal laws uh, that can bring down, you know, that the, they can have uh, jurisdiction and protection over wetlands less than an acre. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add um, my colleagues in our in Riverkeepers water quality program have a drinking water protection scorecard that is specifically designed for municipalities uh, and volunteers in the municipalities and conservation advisory uh, committees and councils to assess protections on the source of their drinking water, on their headwater streams. And those assessments, um, the assessment done with the city of Peekskill uh, with, in partnership with our water quality team, actually led to the discovery of all of these class C streams in Peekskill Hollow Brook that need greater protection. And so if you are in a municipality, if you represent a municipality on a board uh, or the planning board or the CAC, I'd be happy to connect you with my colleagues uh, who can share the scorecard. You can also uh, look it up. You can Google Riverkeeper Drinking Water Scorecard, and it is there available for, for anyone uh, to use. And it's a great tool. Um, I believe we have another question from Patricia, um, who said, can you please recommend any volunteer or internship opportunities for college students? And I believe every or right, each of these organizations probably has opportunities for college students. I know I'm a third year law student and actually I'm interning with um, Riverkeeper right now um, as their legislative intern. So there definitely is an opportunity to um, uh, do the position that I'm in right now. 
with Riverkeeper. Yeah, every, every single year um, I host an intern, usually from the, from the January to June uh, timeframe, uh, which is when our state legislative session is usually in session. Uh, and that's a great internship for law students and master's students. Um, and Riverkeeper hosts other internships that are posted to our jobs board on our website. Uh, each summer we have legal interns that support our legal department. Um, and uh, each year we have volunteer opportunities. Uh, it's a little different this year with COVID-19, um, but in a normal year we have, a clean, we have regular cleanups of the Hudson River and the tributaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can highly recommend Riverkeeper as a place to internship for sure. And I've also had friends who have interned with NRDC and really enjoyed it as well. So, and probably Sierra Club too. <laughs> I mean, I, I will say that we're a volunteer led organization and certainly we're, we're always uh, interested in having more uh, volunteers interested in, in working on a myriad of uh, projects and campaigns. Um, but, you know, clearly we are in a, a different world right now. And so we're still trying to sort out how internships, official internships, uh, what they look like in the future. But we've got a good candidate. And certainly, you know, we can, we're, we're good at, at helping find good fits for people in other organizations or with agencies or projects. But uh, my email is there if, if, uh, if you need help, uh, contact me. Um, I don't see any other question. Well, maybe one popped up. Oh, I think it was just a comment. Hudson River Watershed Alliance and local affili affiliates always need help. All volunteer. Yeah, I would say go back to our. Um, once this is this is posted, this will be uh, posted on Facebook. Uh, the recording. You can go back to the beginning of it uh, to see the list of co-sponsors of today's webinar. And all of those organizations will have internships and volunteer opportunities and uh, highly recommend all of them. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, this presentation will be available to share on Facebook. It will also be up on Riverkeeper's YouTube channel. Uh, of recording. And so I hope uh, you all enjoyed today's pre presentation and we'll share it with your friends. Uh, I want to thank uh, my co-panelists, John and Roger uh, and Renee for joining us today. And I hope everyone has a safe and healthy rest of the day. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.